Hello, I'm Dan Sandweiss. I'm a professor of anthropology and climate studies at the University of Maine, and I'm also the president-elect of National Phi Kappa Phi. I wish I could be with, here with you in person, but due to the circumstances, this is the safest and most appropriate way to speak to you. Perhaps next year we'll get to meet uh, face to face. I hope so. I'm going to talk to you today about work I've been doing over the last 40 years on the coast of Peru to do with the climatic phenomenon known as El Nino and its prehistory. Why study El Nino? It's one of the major drivers of global climate, particularly but not exclusively in the Pacific Basin. As you can see from these citations here, it has a significant effect throughout the world in changing climate. In Peru, it is particularly problematic. On the North Coast during 2017, a short two month event of a particular kind of El Nino known as the coastal El Nino caused significant trouble, significant loss of life and finance and disruption. The numbers 141860 referred to the number of people who lost their homes. The number that's near to a thousand or the or million are the number of people who were affected. And the other numbers show you more about what happened. This was based on an initial estimate right at the end of the event. But several months later, when they had better numbers, you can see that it got even worse as they assessed everything. The cost was over 1% of the gross national product of the country of Peru. And for a relatively poor country, this is a significant problem. And if it's a problem today, it must also have been a problem in the past. Does climate change affect human affairs and how can we know? Before we talk about El Nino, we need to know whether it's important or not in the past. I suggested that it was based on its consequences for life and economy today, but what about in the past? The relationship between climate, environment, and the human world is complex and is modified by a whole slew of factors, which you can see listed here. People have free will. We do what we want. We don't always make the best choices. I think you can all think of examples of that in your own lives and in the broader world. And what happens to us is the outcome of the intersection between what goes on in the natural world and what happens in terms of the human world and the decisions we make and all of the things that affect the decisions we make. How can we study human ecodynamics? That's a fancy term for this relationship between humans and their environment. There are a number of places and times and situations in prehistory where we can get a better idea, even with our limited ability to recover information about past human behavior, about this topic, about human ecodynamics. One is in marginal regions, in places where a change in climate makes a region completely uninhabitable. We can see people coming back and forth, inhabiting and abandoning the area as a direct result of climate change. We can study how they do that, and we can have a better idea about this relationship between people and environments. We can also look at extreme events. Extreme events are things like El Ninos that come for a short time but have a very significant impact on the environment, on resources and on people's lives. And if we can identify those events in the past, we can also identify some of the human outcomes of those events. Finally, we can look at frequency trends. Are events more common or less common? The influence on people will be different for an event that occurs once every 100 years compared to an event that occurs, say, every five or 10 years. And that's a specific example we're going to be looking at with El Nino through time. The coast of Peru is a particularly good place to do this because of El Nino. These are extreme events and they have had frequency variability trends, meaning it's been more common and less common at different times in the past. And much of our work has been dedicated to understanding when those frequency shifts occurred and what people did in response to those shifts. First though, we need to take a brief trip to the coast of Peru to understand what the environment is like, this environment that changes as a result of El Nino. By the way, this white stuff here is not snow. Those are birds. You can imagine what it is, a very rich source of fertilizer for fields. So Peru is a tropical country. It lies entirely 
within the tropical zone in less than 23 and a half degrees south of the equator. In fact, the equator passes through the northernmost part of the country in this map. So you might imagine the coast looks like you see in this slide here, but in fact, it does not. The coast of Peru is one of the world's driest deserts. And again, this white stuff you see is not snow. In this case, it's sand. This is what it looks like between the river valleys that do have water coming down from the highlands. This is just one very large dune. It's so big that it has its own name. It's called Purpur. And the fellow on the right in the blue suit is about six feet tall. And I took the picture from the bottom of this dune. So you get an idea how vastly big this thing is. Why then do we have a prehistory? Why did people live here? Not just live here, but have large populations and a very robust economy with political organizations getting larger and more complex all the way up to a vast empire covering over a thousand kilometers of coastline not long before the Spaniards arrived to conquer Peru in 1532. There are two reasons for this two sources of rich resources. The first is the ocean. One of the reasons that the Peruvian coast is a desert is that it is fronted by a cold Antarctic current called the Humboldt or Peru current. This current drives nutrient upwelling, uh, nutrient rich deep water comes up and feeds the food chain from various kinds of plankton all the way through large fish, seabirds, sea mammals, and mollusks. So the fishery is one of the world's richest. At times, it has been the most productive fishery in the world. The second resource is the water that comes down from the Andean Mountains immediately to the east, where it does rain, with wind coming off of the Amazon all the way from the Atlantic. That rainfall falls either as snow, or that precipitation falls as snow on glaciers, which melt seasonally or they fall in the valleys and gather into rivers. Some of these rivers come down to the coast on the west, and so they provide water to irrigate the valleys. And because this is a tropical zone, although it is very dry, it is not very cold. Typical cold winter weather would be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 58 degrees. In other words, warm enough to grow plants. If you have water, you can grow all year round. You can see this rich valley here, the, the green goes as far as the uppermost canal in the far distance. Of course, you can see what it looks like beyond the canal. It's entirely arid uh, because water does not flow uphill. Now let's take a look at El Nino on the coast. And in this individual standing in vegetation that grows during El Nino, because one of the things that happens is that extensive rains fall. What is El Nino? It's a Spanish word that means the child. Uh, you want to remember that because I'll have a few visual puns related to El Nino being the child. It was originally named by fishermen in southern Ecuador and northern Peru for a seasonal warming that occurs in January or December, end of December at the beginning of the southern hemisphere summer. Um, so they named it for El Nino for the Christ child because it starts about Christmas time. Later, this term was applied to a warming that occurs not every year, but at irregular intervals, but significantly warmer and extending a great deal further south. And that is what we now call El Nino. And it causes a very significant change to the coast of Peru, as well as to other parts of the world in most kinds of El Nino events. We now know that it's related to a pressure differential between the Eastern and Western Pacific. This is called the Southern Oscillation. So for the entire global phenomenon, the formal name is El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO. But for this talk, we are going to focus on what happens in the Eastern Pacific along the Western shore of South America and particularly Peru, and that is the part known as El Nino. This is a view of temperature anomalies. In other words, oh, how much the temperature varies from normal conditions during an El Nino event. This is a particular event, one of the big ones of the late 20th century. And you can see that the redder the colors, the warmer it is compared to normal. You can see it extending to the right and going down the coast of Western South America, the part touched by the darkest red is the Peruvian coast. Today, we call this the canonical or Eastern Pacific El Nino, and it describes the warm phase of a naturally occurring sea surface temperature oscillation in the tropical Pacific Ocean. 
this oscillation is associated with the atmospheric phenomena known as the Southern Oscillation, as I told you, or the, in other words, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. However, there are other kinds or what we call flavors of El Nino. Each year, we seem to get more. La Nina was the first to be identified. That's sort of the reverse of a normal El Nino. If an El Nino brings extraordinary warming to the Eastern Pacific, La Nina brings extraordinary cooling. The effects aren't nil, but they are much less for humans who live in the area than a regular or Eastern Pacific El Nino. El Nino Modoque, or the Central Pacific El Nino, has only been known for about 15 years, maybe a little bit less, discovered by Japanese meteorologists in the mid-2000s. It refers to events that warm in the Central Pacific, like an El Nino, that's where a regular Eastern Pacific El Nino begins in the Central Pacific, but unlike an Eastern Pacific or EP El Nino, in which the warm water more or less sloshes to the east and hits the coast of South America, the Modoki events or the CP or Central Pacific El Nino events stay in the Central Pacific. It may even get slightly cooler along the coast of Peru. Not as cold as during La Nina, but cooler than normal by perhaps half a degree. This is a, also an anomaly map of a recent Modoki event from 2004 to 2005. And you can see that there is warming in that central Pacific area, that sort of orange to yellow splash to the left of the map. But it stays very white or even very light blue for slight cooling below normal, below average normal conditions on the coast of Peru. The final and most recently discovered flavor of El Nino is the coastal El Nino. This happened several times in the 20th century we know now, but it wasn't really recognized until 2017 when this extraordinary event hit the north coast of Peru. It got even warmer than the big, big events of the late 20th century. That was 1982, 83, and 1997, 98. But it really didn't go much further south than Lima, and it didn't affect the rest of the world, the rest of the Pacific, the way an Eastern Pacific El Nino, or even a Modoki or, a, or La Nina would do. It was very limited. It also lasted only two months and then went away. But that's the event I showed you at the beginning, that despite its limited reach in terms of area, only half of the coast of Peru, and its limited time, only two months, caused a huge amount of damage. So this is just a cartoon, as, um, as geologists would call it, that shows what happens. The upper left is a normal year in which you have deep nutrient upwelling from the Humboldt current, which feeds the food chain all the way up to large sea mammals. The right, the lower right, is during an El Nino, an EP El Nino event, and there is much the much less deep nutrient upwelling, and consequently, there are fewer animals, much lower biomass along the coast of Peru. Biomass is what people exploit out of the ocean. It's not that there's nothing, but there's a lot less than there was. There are also different species, which requires some adjustment. Now, one of the things that happens, and now we'll be talking mainly about the Eastern Pacific events, which for the North Coast are, are also the coastal and the NeuroCOA events. Um, the, they have an effect on stream flow. So the blue line here is what happens during an Eastern Pacific El Nino, in which it rains torrentially on the coast of Peru, and it more than doubles the amount of flow that comes out of the rivers. This is a typical one of the larger rivers on the north coast, the river called Chicama. During, the green line shows you the normal flow throughout, throughout the year. This is driven by precipitation and glacier melt in the highlands. And then the red line shows you what happens during a Modoque El Nino. On this case, we get about half as much rain in the highlands or glacial melt and half as much water coming down to the coast. This is something we've only recognized recently. It must have had an effect on past people. It will have an effect and does have an effect on people today, but it has not been well studied yet. And we have no way to determine yet when it happened in the past. When an Eastern Pacific El Nino happens, because of the torrential rain, there is really serious rainfall. So this image shows you a wellhead in northern Peru, the area that is hardest hit by these El Nino events. You can see the uh, here in the box, that's plant material that got 
caught by the top of this during the last flood. But that's also about where the ground surface was before the 1982-83 and 1997-98 events. So a tremendous amount of land has been stripped off here by these torrential floods. They are very effective in moving earth, and that, of course, is very bad for people. This is a bridge in Ecuador. This is a photo from National Geographic that was destroyed by the 82-83 El Nino floods. Tremendous force. With all that standing water that you get when these events occur in what's normally a desert, you also get lots of insects, many of which are disease vectors. And I know this isn't an insect, it's a, a no, scorpion. Uh, I didn't have a lens that let me take a picture of a mosquito, so this is the closest I could get to remind me. But many diseases become endemic during El Nino events, uh, malaria, chikungunya, Zika, and dengue today, probably malaria in the past, maybe other diseases, uh, which we're currently unfamiliar with. The first big event after the Spanish conquest of 1532 took place in 1578. It was really destructive on the North Coast, even more so because the, in the wake of loss of population as a result of the conquest, the Spaniards had just finished moving people throughout the country of Peru, what is today the country of Peru, to centralize settlements, to bring them under better control, to be able to catechize them, to turn them into good Christians and save their souls. That was how they justified using the labor of native people. And because they didn't know about El Nino and don't seem to have asked about environmental hazards, they often moved them into the wake of the floods, if we're talking about North Coast towns and villages. This happened in the Lombaque Valley, and this is what one witness said in the wake of the event about what had happened, and by now you've probably been able to read this. As you can see, it's not really very good for agriculture. Um, they also talk of witnesses talk about buildings being washed away, canals being destroyed, so on and so forth. It's a very bad event if you're on the North Coast. It uh, gets slightly less bad as you move south with slightly more replacement. Using this uh, document that we have from 1578, a series of interviews of witnesses in various places that were affected by the event, we get some idea of the coping strategies that people use. And because this was within two generations of the Spanish conquest of 1532, some people were still alive who had been born before the conquest. And because people were still largely organized under native lords, there's probably a fair amount of memory of what to do. And so we think that some of these strategies were the ones that would have been adopted by people in times before the arrival of the Spaniards. One is relocation, or what we sometimes call habitat tracking. Go where the resources still are. This could be locally to higher ground. It could be longer distance, oh, about 180 kilometers to the city of Trujillo, although that was also badly affected. Oh, 800 and some kilometers south to Lima, or four or 500 kilometers north into the mountains to Quito, or directly east closer to the mountains, which were less affected than the coast. This is a, just a quick graphic of where people went, uh, Lima, Trujillo, and uh, the upper arrow goes to Quito in Ecuador. Another strategy was to try replanting. Oh, they had to do that. They had to restart the agriculture after the destruction. But from the quotation that you saw earlier from the witness to this event, that took a while to be successful, at least a year. They had to build or rebuild. Oh, in, as the event started, they would build platforms and shelters to try and keep what they had stored dry and out of the floodwaters. Uh, for several months, the natives were forced by the Spanish overseers to rebuild the main canal. Uh, ultimately, they were going to need that, but they were uh, petitioning the royal court in Lima for tribute relief and not, uh, the, not having to do this rebuilding of the main canal until they could rebuild their local structures first. Uh, they were not successful in that. Refinancing. They were still being charged tribute. They had to pay it. Uh, they would sell textiles and animals at low prices to raise funds. They would exchange corn or maize for cotton to pay tribute. Cotton was highly prized by the Spaniards. It was indigenous to Peru. They exchanged service to Spaniards for food. They stole. Uh, they had a number of other strategies as well. 
uh, as typically happens during famines, they ate wild foods, sometimes called famine foods, lizards, grasses, fruits, seeds, whatever was still available. They asked for mercy from the king. These things in blue may have made them feel better, but didn't seem to have any actual real world effect. They cried, and they complained. Oh, this is happening today. Now, before I leave you thinking that El Nino is entirely negative, there are some opportunities for adaptation. And although the net result of one of the major events is more negative than positive, I did want to go over some of the positive things that could happen during an event. One is marine species replacement. The further south you are, the more true this is. As the El Nino warm water moves south, the large schools of fish that make the Peruvian fishery so rich also migrate to the south, and they come on shore briefly on the central coast, which would be around Lima. And if you know what to do with them, then you can take advantage of this resource. You can dry them, smoke them, store them, and have a food for the time when there is much less to be extracted from the ocean. If you don't know what to do with them, then it's a serious health hazard. This happened not related to El Nino on a North Coast village when I was living there 30 years ago. Oh, 700 metric tons of fish jumped out on the shore one day. It happened to be on St. Joseph's Day in the village of St. Joseph or San Jose. All the people there thought it was a miracle. The saint was feeding them. That lasted for a day. They didn't know what to do with it. The fish began to rot. People became ill and the government had to come in and bulldoze it all under the beach sand to remove the health hazard. I also wanted to mention that from Lima to the south, scallops, which are normally present, become much more abundant. In 82, 83, during one of the big events of the 20th century, you could buy a dozen scallops for about 50 cents US, maybe even less, or you could just go out and swim around and pick them up in the water. Uh, this is, has to do with changes in the oxygen saturation at the on the bay floors where these scallops live. And this has happened in the past. The map in the upper left with the numbers, each one is a pile, a big pile of scallop shells and charcoal, as you see in the bottom right. They date to about 3,600 years ago, 1900 BC. Oh, and this is something that, that probably happened repeatedly and people took advantage of it. This place is south of Lima where the effects are less negative and more positive. People may have been building structures to capture flood water. This is an aqueduct, but it also cuts off water flow from local rainfall during El Nino events. As you can see, it hasn't been breached. Potentially, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the event, people could use the wet soil to grow crops. Uh, you may be able to make out here, perhaps I can pointed out with the arrow along here. This is an aqueduct and a canal. And there are areas behind the canal here and here, uh, which uh, also capture water, have not been breached. You can see here the, the aqueduct not breached. And there's water just runoff from irrigation captured here. During El Nino, there's a great deal more. And this is behind the canal in one of the smaller areas in 2017, following the 2017 coastal event when people actually did grow crops and, and oh, it has proof of concept that it's at least possible to do this. We don't know yet if they did it in the past, but we suspect they did. This canal dates to 1000 AD, so it would have been capturing water for the last thousand years. The deserts bloom during El Nino. What's normally a desert becomes full of plants. There are plants that grow to a lesser degree in the austral or southern hemisphere winter. They're called lomas plants. They grow from the fog that accumulates. It doesn't rain because it's a desert, but it does get very densely foggy, and there are some plants adapted to that. These plants go wild during El Nino, and you can see some of them here. And just another image of that. Uh, in 1982-83, people brought their herds down from the highlands where they were having a serious drought, which usually happens during El Nino in the southern highlands of Peru and they pastured them on these lomas plants. Oh. In 82-83, the, the animals they brought were cows, sheep, goats, donkeys, horses, oh. but in pre-Hispanic times, the large herded animal that they had was the llama, also the alpaca, very similar, and that's what they would have brought down. 
although the floods are very destructive, we talked about that for 1578, they also go over banks as the water gets out of the channels and slows down. And it has, because it's eroded the soil from the fields higher up the valley, it deposits good soil on top of the fields in the lower valley, helping to fertilize them for future seasons. Finally, almost finally, Algarobo trees, which is the typical tree of the desert. It's basically a carob. It has uh, leguminous fruits that, uh, with pods that you can grind up and you can consume. You can feed them to animals. These actually depend on El Nino to grow in the desert. They put down their tap roots during an El Nino event when the, everything is saturated with water. The tap roots get down to the uh, groundwater, and then the plants or the trees can live thereafter. These were the primary source of firewood, charcoal, and building wood along the coast throughout prehistory and into modern times. Landscape construction is yet another positive effect of El Nino. When the floods come, as I said earlier, they deposit flood materials on various parts of the landscape. They erode in places, they deposit in others. What we're seeing here is about four meters of archaeological deposits that go back to about 400 AD. And then below that, there were El Nino laid deposits that built up the landscape to the point where it was above almost every flood that could occur. And that's the point when people began to live here. And once they did, because it was higher, uh, there was no flood that eroded these, this site away. Uh, we found this as well. Uh, uh, there's a look, sorry, there's a look at some of those flood deposits from El Nino building up the landscape. And we also went to the largest adobe mound in South America, also on the north coast of Peru at the Moche site. This is the Huaca del Sol. I'm taking it from its paired mound, the Huaca de la Luna, or the Temple of the Moon. Uh, there too, we dug a pit underneath the structure. You can see on the right, the adobes or mud bricks from the structure below that where we dug our pit. The left is a close-up of the pit. These are all water-laid sediments related to El Nino flooding. And again, at about 400 AD, people began to build here. And although it rained on them, the river never came and eroded this high again because it, the landscape had built up to a safe level. So the moche seemed to have recognized when landscapes reached this safe area and they took advantage of it to build structures that would be uh, unaffected by the major flooding erosion during these events and indeed have been unaffected in that way for the last thousand uh, to 1500 years. Crisis management. Rahm Emanuel, who was Obama's first chief of staff and then became the mayor of Chicago, is famous for saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. And it's very likely given that almost all human populations have people with the gene for political entrepreneurship or the uh, gene for interest in power. Maybe it's psychological, not a gene, but some people have it. Uh, and they likely took advantage of these events to say, I have a solution for you. It might have been a supernatural solution, but if people believe them, they could use it to garner power and to get people to do what they want. We'll see later that seems to have happened. So if we summarize all of the natural and human effects of El Nino on the Peruvian coast, we have both the downside, which in the aggregate is uh, more than the upside, but there is also an upside. I've been through this already, so I won't, I won't belabor this. Now, if we want to study El Nino in the past and understand what it had to do with cultural development in this area with human life, then we have to know when it happened in the past. The way we know about past climate is through what are called paleoclimate archives. Paleoclimate just means past climate. Archives are records. And there are a variety of ways that climate scientists get at paleoclimate from what is left behind for us to study. In the, co in the case of Peru, uh, most of the normal ways of doing it aren't there, but we do have 13,000 or more years of archaeological deposits that encode a signal about what El Nino was doing. And this is what I've been working on particularly for the last 40 years. So here's one of the normal ways that you can get a very detailed climate signal. You cut cores into glaciers and you look at the ice, which accumulates over time with the newest instruments for several thousand years, you can see individual storms. 
the resolution gets less as you go down, but you can go thousands and thousands of years looking at what happens over the course of a year. However, although there are glaciers in Peru, they are on the eastern side of the Andes and they are largely affected by water flow coming from the Atlantic, not the Pacific. And so they are an imperfect record of what's happening in the Pacific, which is El Nino. Another way that people get high resolution records is through corals. Corals grow sequentially as well. And you can study them chemically and get some idea about marine climate, ocean climate. But because Peru is washed by a cold current, we have no corals. Lakes are less high resolution normally than corals or ice cores, but they do accumulate sediment on the bottom through time, and that does give a signal through time of what's happening in the environment. But this is also a problem because being a desert, there really aren't lakes, with one possible exception that we'll come to later on. What we do have, as I said, are 13,000 or more years of archeological sites from on the upper, upper and these pictures, these go back to about 12,500 years ago. Uh, this is a site on the southern coast of Peru. Uh, the blue things are not blueberries, even though it was dug by people from, from Peru. These are uh, blue balloons we put in to mark all of the post holes uh, from where they had the posts of their house that are approximately the same time. And all the way through time up until the arrival of the Spaniards, this is a very large site in northern Peru called Tucumé that was occupied from about 1100 AD right up to the Spanish conquest and then abandoned almost immediately. And we have a number of tools to extract information about El Nino from what we find in and in association with archeological sites. This is my colleague, Professor Michael Mosley from the University of Florida, uh, discovering some evidence for El Nino on the beach in Northern Peru. Um, this is a list, I'm not going to go through this because it would be a whole nother lecture, but suffice it to say, we have a number of ways to get at El Nino signals in archeological sites, fortunately, since these are the best archives that we've got. And there's the evidence for El Nino. And yet another uh, visual image of El Nino on the beach. I'm gonna talk about some of the reasons why we need to be cautious in interpreting what El Nino may have done or may not have done to people in the past on the coast of Peru. This is an attempt to get at the population history for the coast of Western South America. It's done by accumulating radiocarbon dates and manipulating them statistically. It's, the squiggles are probably not real, but the general trend probably is. This goes from 14,000 till 2,000 years ago. And uh, based on our records of El Nino, we divided it up into various segments. When people first arrived, these are now BC dates, uh, from 11,000 to 7,000 or 13,000 to 5,000 before present, before now. We know El Nino was present. It, caused, it, it certainly was a source of high risk, environmental risk for people. But human complexity was low, populations were low, and people were hunter, fisher, and gatherers who were able to move around the landscape and seek out resources. If they had a, a loss in one area, they could go somewhere else. From about 7,000 to oh, 3,800 years ago, El Nino seemed, or before present, oh, before, ah, excuse me, oh, 7,000 to 3,800 BC. We believe El Nino was absent or very, very rare on the north coast of Peru. So risk from El Nino was low, environmental risk. People had a medium complexity. They were fishers and gatherers with horticulture, meaning small scale agriculture. They had some domesticated plants, both for food and for tools at this point. And they were beginning by the end of this time to live in small villages. As we can see, if we drew a line, uh, uh, a line of, of trend here, you'd see it's more or less flat. It goes up and down, but there's no real growth in this time. There had been growth it went back here. Um, if we can believe this record, the population was beginning to grow. And then if we move forward from 3800 to about 950 BC, El Nino has come back, but at least on the North Coast, it is not as common in this period or was not as common as it was subsequently or is today. So we'd say the risk is medium. People now have high complexity. They're building monumental centers. They have agriculture, mainly for what we call industrial crops. These are mainly cotton and gourds used to make nets, containers, and floats for the nets. 
rather than food plants. Although they have food plants, they don't seem to be a major part of the diet. Uh, fishing has now shifted to extremely productive, if not quite as tasty, fishing of small schooling fish, meaning sardines and anchovies, uh, using nets made out of cotton, which were particularly well adapted to this kind of fishery and extremely productive. And then about 950 BC, El Nino comes back uh, as a very frequent event. It had been present maybe once every 100 years in the previous period. Now it's every five to 10 years. The shift seems to be fairly sudden at about 950 BC. Risk is again high, but at this point, complexity is extremely high. People are living in state level societies. They're using irrigation agriculture extensively. They are getting a lot of their food from, uh, from domesticated crops. Yes, they're still growing cotton and gourds, but they're now growing a lot of other things in large quantities that they can eat. Uh, but if you look at the trend here, both here in medium risk and here in high risk, and this continues up to the arrival of the Spaniards in 1532, population seems to be growing. So despite the increased risk, people are still prospering on average, although there were undoubtedly ups and downs. So that's one thing that we wanna think about that even though El Nino became more and more frequent over the last 8,000 years, so too did population become larger, uh, which seems counterintuitive and it means we have to be very careful about overinterpreting the effect of El Nino or El Nino frequency on cultural development. Now we're going to look at specifically the Lambayeque Valley in the North Coast and the history of burning and abandonment of sites over the last 1500 years of prehistory. So we're going to look at three sites, first Pampa Grande, then Tucumé, or then Batan Grande, excuse me, and then finally at Tucumé. So this is the biggest mound, the one really large one at Pampa Grande. You can see the uh, dates here. This is Batan Grande, you can see the dates here. This is the place that produced most of the gold from Peru present in museums throughout the world. And much of this gold was also melted down in the 20th century and sold as gold or sold as objects, but to private collectors and not available in museums. Uh, for a very brief period, several hundred years, it was a very rich place. And then finally, Tucumé, the last of these, which started maybe 1000, maybe 1100 AD, and it went until the arrival of the Spaniards or maybe a few years afterwards. Oh. What is interesting about all of these places is that at the moment they were abandoned, they were also burned, or at least the temples on top of their mounds were burned. And then although people lived in the area still, they did not occupy the monumental architecture again after each abandonment. So a question we asked is, did this have anything to do with the climate and particularly with El Nino? Uh, we put together some of the climate records that are available, particularly the brown line at the bottom, which is from an ocean core. It's another source of paleoclimate data, not as well dated, but it more or less fits, uh, fits what we know about El Nino frequencies. And this is covering the last approximately 2,000 years. So we can see that when the blue line, the, the uh, vertical blue line, is when Pampa Grande was abandoned, it was abandoned right at a peak in El Nino activity, peak of intensity, and then oh, El Nino became much less frequent while Batan Grande was becoming such a wealthy, rich place and prospering. Then the purple line, vertical line, when Batan Grande is abandoned, there's a little peak and then a drop, oh, but it seems hard to believe that would have been enough to drive a wholesale abandonment. And then in the case of Tucumé, the green vertical line, the site was abandoned when there was nothing special about the El Nino related climate. Uh, but we know in fact what happened when Tucumé was abandoned or why it was abandoned. It had to do with the Spanish conquest and not directly to do with climate. So again, the climate may be part of the story early on uh, in this sequence, uh, probably not in the middle and definitely not at the end. So this too gives us caution in over-interpreting the effect of climatic change on cultural development in this region. Now let's take a look at some case studies. So as I said, El Nino, and referring to the Eastern Pacific, but also coastal El Nino on the North Coast, begins at low frequency, about 3800 BC. And this is when people start building large temples. This is the earliest, that big thing you see, 
was made by people putting walls to capture sand. So it was partly constructed and partly captured from nature, but it's a very big building, 15 meters high, 250 meters long, about 150 meters wide. Uh, but in general, there, as, as this period continued, uh, what we call the late pre-ceramic period and the initial period, temples spread throughout the entire region where you see the red line. This is one of the earlier smaller mounds shortly after the site we just saw. That's the site we saw, Los Morteros. We saw it from ground level. You can see from this air photograph how big it is. Sorry about that. All right, back to well, what's happening in the late pre-ceramic period. This is the site of Caral. This is the single biggest site of the late pre-ceramic period. Those are all mounds you see here. And here is um, an image of some of those mounds. They're pretty large given their age, which is about uh, 3,800, 4,000 years before now, or about 2,000 BC on average. Uh, they continue building mounds. This is a site near Lima called El Paraiso. This is the smallest of six mounds at the site, but this one's been reconstructed, so it gives some idea what it would have looked like originally. Uh, and then in this period, the, the area that had the greatest amount of construction in the late pre-ceramic part of this time is called the Norte Chico or the North Central Coast, which you see in the map here. This is where the site of Caral, the biggest site, is located, but there are many, many other sites of this period here. They were abandoned in the middle of this period, not when El Nino became more frequent, but before that. And to understand that, we need to know something about the sediment cycle and how it affects people on the coast of Peru. It starts with earthquakes, which are frequent in this area. This is in the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's what's called a subduction zone. The oceanic Nazca plate is going under the South American continental plate. So there are serious earthquakes on a regular basis. This one was from, I think, 2007, which is a little bit south of Lima. When the earthquakes happen, they produce a lot of loose sediment on the unvegetated surface of the desert, on the hill slopes. And it mostly just sits there, it moves very slowly through what's called mass wasting. But basically, it just sits there, not held in place by roots, but not moving significantly because there's no rainfall. When El Nino comes, torrential rains wash that sediment down the slopes into the rivers, which are now uh, flowing a great deal faster so they can carry a lot more sediment. And it takes it down to the, to the coast where it deposits a large amount of sediment that builds to the north in what's called a beach ridge. And then the sand part of it gets blown inland uh, on the constant winds that always blow from the southwest, the Pacific, to the north, northeast. Up, up along the shore and slightly inland. Uh, this is a big sand dune caused by this effect in the north part of Peru. Um, these are more, and again, we've seen this picture before, but another uh, illustration of the immense amount of sand that can blow inland to the north of major rivers once this material has been deposited by the El Nino events. In the Norte Chico, this is what happened. The, uh, Arrows marked one are the sediment coming down during El Nino events with the rainfall. What's marked with two is the formation of a very large beach ridge that covered about 100 kilometers full of both gravel and sand. And then the arrows with three is the sand moving inland on the wind in the years following these events. We think this started about 4,000 years ago and the wind began to move the sand in large quantities, winnowing it out by about 3,800 years ago or 1800 um, BC. And you can still see the sand, it's still a movement, this still happens today. Uh, you can see it on the landscape moving in the direction of those arrows marked three. Now we thought that this swamping of sand might have had something to do with the abandonment of these, all of these late pre-ceramic monumental centers in the Norte Chico, but to be certain that it was at least a possibility, we had to make certain the right events happened in the right sequence. First, we look for evidence of earthquakes. On the left, on a site by the coast, we can see the cracks in a floor. You see where the arrows are, caused by an earthquake, and then one final rebuilding. That's the lighter material to the right, and then the site was abandoned. So it wasn't abandoned at the time of the earthquake, but not very long after. To the right, that's the top of the biggest mound at Caral. Uh, there, the entire top had sort of rotated 
so that it's slanted. Oh, that's a result of a very large earthquake. And then there was one final construction, which went back to being straight up and down, or very nearly straight up and down. And then the site was also abandoned. All of these sites show sand coming in, even if they're far from the shore, at about the time that they were abandoned. So we think this is what happened. Oh, there's actually sand covering the last floor at one of these sites. So we believe that with the sand coming in as a result of this sediment cycle, fields became less productive and the large monumental centers lost their resource base and people stopped supporting them and many of them probably had to go elsewhere. Uh, we see that this happened progressively from south to north. So if you look on this chart, ignore the, the EP on the right and the SC on the left for the moment, but you can see that as you move to the left, you're moving up in time with the abandonment. That makes sense because the wind blows basically from southwest to northeast. So you would abandon first in the south and it would get progressively uh, further north as the sand kept moving inland. There's the area where the sand affected people and where sites were abandoned. And then on either end, you see El Paraiso or EP and Salinas de Chao or SC. These are the two sites of a pre-ceramic pre or not pottery using lifeway that continued to have this conservative lifeway for several hundred years after everybody else had adopted pottery. Our suggestion is that this is where many of the people went. They were climate migrants or climate migrants as we talk about today, and they may well have brought this conservative, formerly successful late pre-ceramic lifeway with them and helped to keep people in this lifeway and avoiding the use of ceramics, which was a newfangled thing that came down from Ecuador uh, at about 3,600 years ago. Now, if we go back to this possible representation of population shifts, we can see that depending on how exact the timing is, we are either at a drop in population or a loss in, or a growth in population, but this is for the entire coast. In any case, the trend is mostly up at this time still. Was this a climate-driven catastrophe? I would say it was. Was there cultural change? This is very clearly the case. Uh, even if that change was to stay conservative in two sites while everybody else is changing. Was it a collapse? Possibly. It was a collapse of the centers in the Norte Chico, but on the rest of the coast, people began or continued to build mounds without an eruption on similar patterns, building off of what they had been doing earlier. So in that sense, it's not quite a collapse, it's a relocation, a local collapse, but a broader continuity. Here are some of the sites as part of that continuity, a very large a site covers two uh, kilometers from the mound on the left to the mound on the right. They're what's called bilaterally symmetrical, meaning that if you drew a line through the middle of them, that line would be the mound, each mound would be a mirror image one side to the other. That line goes exactly through the middle of the left-hand mound, through the, all the way across through the middle of the right-hand mound. A very uh, high degree of city planning already taking place here. This is another temple in the same valley, which became the new center of fluorescence for initial period culture, continuation of mound building uh, after the Norte Chico was largely abandoned. Uh, this one is our first graphic evidence of interpersonal violence. Uh, the final phase had carved stones on the outer walls of this temple. Uh, the far left is a banner by the doorway. Then there are periodically warriors with weapons leading processions of body parts moving to the right. The warrior is the second one. Uh, then you have vertebrae, a severed head, severed arms. There are many other body parts, eyes, legs, trunks, intestines, uh, so on and so forth. This is another of these mounds. This is near the airport in Lima. It's so large that through the 50s, people thought that it was just a natural hill and they put the power tower on top of it, but it was excavated. It was found to be an artificial mound and to have important early art on the inside, as you see here. And then about 950 BC, they stopped building all of these mounds. They're all abandoned, not usually burned, as we saw at later times on the North Coast, but they are abandoned and for hundreds of years, although people lived in large sites, they were no longer building mounds as their architecture of power or of religion. This is exactly when El Nino increases in frequency. Uh, when we first discovered this change, we 
could only date it between 3200 and 2800 years ago or 1200 and, and 800 BC. But um, as always, the devil's in the details. How close does it get in time? And for this, we go to the one thing like a lake that we have as a paleoclimate archive on the coast of Peru. This is in the north, a place called the Satura Desert, which stops being a desert during El Nino events. Freshwater runoff creates what we call an ephemeral freshwater lake that lasts for several years. It occurred to me many years ago that if that happened on a regular basis in the past, it would leave some kind of signature or record behind. So we excavated and in fact found it did. Uh, there were little felt-like layers of dried algae that had grown in the lake. Uh, you can date algae using radiocarbon dating and we did that, we took them out. And we found that most of them dated between about 950, 900 and uh, maybe 600 BC, about the time when we see this collapse. To see if this could be reflected in any of the sites that we know were abandoned at this time or where they abandoned the building of monuments, we're fortunate to have the work of Jason Nesbitt at a site called Caballo Muerto, uh, which is a site on the north coast in the Moche Valley, and particularly at a mound called the Waka Cortada or the Cortada Mound, which you see here. First, at the time of abandonment of this mound, he found water lane uh, deposits, which you see at the bottom just above the number three. Uh, in the actually where it says number two, if you can see that, it's kind of dark, all uh, the very classic water lane deposits. Clearly there was a massive event or series of events at the time the site was abandoned. When we looked at all of the dates he had associated with water lane deposits, he had one before El Ni they began building this mound between 1600 and 1450 BC. There were three events during the time the mound was used and then a massive event or series of events at the time that the mound was abandoned. The up till the time of abandonment, that's about the one per hundred years that we would have guessed would, or I guess we estimated from our other records was the frequency, the low frequency of El Nino events. And then we have this final one, which coincides exactly with the time of frequent de deposition in the Satura Desert in that ephemeral lake that kept filling up and drying out, filling up and drying out. And yet we look at this again in this, in this uh, possible population chart. Are we at a, an uptick, a slight downturn? Unclear, they may not be meaningful uh, as spikes anyway, but the, clearly the general trend is still up. So even though people are abandoning mounds completely for hundreds of years, they are not depopulating the region. They're not even abandoning complexity. They're just doing it differently. And here's one of the typical sites of the following years, the rest of the first millennium BC, of a place called Kailan. We can see it's large, it's complex, but it has no mounds. It's a different, that what's in the middle on the right, that's a hill, but not a mound. All the main center of the site was an open plaza, which you see about here, all in the middle of the map. So a very different way of organizing people, probably a different religious system. It's tempting to say that Oh, for the period from 5,800 years ago or 3,800 BC till about 950 BC, political entrepreneurs, religious entrepreneurs convinced people that if they built a temple and they took care of the temple, they would keep El Nino away. If it only came back every five generations or so, that would seem effective. And then the priest could say, when it comes back, when it came back, well, you haven't been making enough offerings, rebuild the temple. We know all these temples were built and rebuilt and rebuilt over time. But if it started occurring every five to 10 years instead of every 50 to 100, then people may have had a crisis of faith and all decided to change the religious system altogether. This is what we call a just so story. It fits all the data we know, but we could never prove that it's actually the case. Uh, it does make sense, however. So the change in architectural organization of sites shows a loss of temple mounds coincident with an increase in El Nino frequency. Is this a, a crisis of faith? I'd like to think so, but I just want to be clear, I can't prove it. I can only suggest it. So was this a climate-driven catastrophe? Pretty clearly it was. Was there cultural change? Very significant cultural change. Was it a collapse? Again, we don't really know. It was a change. 
It was from one system to another, whatever drove it. And given the timing, in some way it's related to this change in frequency in El Nino. Oh, but it's not really a collapse because sites are still large, populations are large, possibly still growing, and there's still a high degree of complex organization. Oops. So how can this help the present and the future? First, given that the other paleoclimate records for the coast of Peru, the heartland of El Nino, largely are absent or else they give equivocal signals because they're affected by other climate systems. The archeological data are unique in helping us refine the models that climatologists make to predict climate that are our best hope of predicting and mitigating El Nino. For instance, El Nino seems to have been less common during the, what we call the middle Holocene during this period from 3800 BC to about Oh, 8,000 BC, 7,000 BC. Seems to have been less frequent. Is that going to happen again? That would probably be good. But the only way that climatologists who create these climate models can test them is by using them to predict a climate that's actually known in the past. They input the various parameters to do with orbits and other parts of the climate that they already know about. And then they see if their model actually generates results that we know to be true. So they're important in this way. For a key area, it's one of the best sources of data we have on paleoclimate for the last 13 to 14,000 years. We can also see how people faced the stresses of El Nino in the past. They lived with this for thousands of years, and they seem to have developed a number of adaptations that are well suited to this area. For instance, water management, creating of more check dams to hold in water and have at least some replacement agriculture while the fields are being are refertilized and, and the canal systems are being rebuilt to get water to them, like we saw that example from the North Coast that could be done in greater numbers. We can also see medium and long-term processes that are not always evident in either the modern record in, in human memory because they're too long, or in the geological record, which usually looks at even longer periods. We have this human scale, but multi-centennial time perspective from archaeology that lets us see, th see things like the sediment cycle that I went through for you. Uh, that hasn't stopped. Nobody's really paying attention to it. We've been trying to, to alert people to it, and that's another important result that we have. Finally, uh, if our just-so story is right, then it shows that climate change can lead to a loss of faith, and that may be significant. Um, for the future. I say regime change because it was a change in climatic regime. Other regime changes may also lead to loss of faith. That's really all I have to tell you. It has been a pleasure talking to you. There's more evidence for El Nino we discovered in 2006 on the north coast of Peru. Uh, if you have questions, please ask for my email address and I would be happy to have an email conversation with you. Thank you so much and stay safe, stay healthy.